Okay. I think everybody's in or on their way in. Um, so good, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our uh, fl flow cytometry core facility virtual classroom uh, hosted by Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, that will be my, my only snafu of the day as I try to get that word out. <laughs> um, so welcome everyone for people who are joining us for the first time. Um, my name is Kathy Daniels and I'm the manager of the facility at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And you see right below me is Ruby Gardner, who is the head of the facility at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And this is, I believe, our sixth session. Um, it's kind of all a blur at this point. <laughs> um, and it's our sixth session on uh, Flojo version 10.6.2, where we go over, um, you know, some best um, practices for data analysis and, and all different um, tips for utilizing Flojo. So, uh, as you can see by the little dot plot that we have there, uh, we're going to be going over some troubleshooting data today. Um, and we're going to be really focusing on, um, you know, some experimental tips and, and what you can use to pull out in. Um, in Flojo to make your experiments better. Okay, so whenever you're asking that question, what is this? Why do I see this? Why does my data not look right? We're going to be going over some of that today. So go to the next slide. Um, so just a, a quick summary of topics of what we're going to be going over today. Um, like I said, some troubleshooting and specifically we're going to be talking about poor controls, right? We're going to be talking about, um, you know, the inclusion of viability dyes and why that's so important. Um, when people are tempted to reuse old compensation, right? I, I ran the compensation three months ago when I first did this. I don't need to run it again. We're going to take a look at that and if that's okay. Uh, checking quality of uh, your FCS files um, uh, by time. We're going to look at some off-scale data, and uh, we're also going to look at some antibody uh, titration troubleshooting. So it's kind of a, a mixed bag of a, a variety of different things that we're going to be reviewing today um, as, as we go through. Okay. So some important links before we get started. Uh, the first is the Flojo link um, specifically to the COVID-19 license, um, but it'll also take you, you know, to the Flojo website itself. And they've been uh, pretty wonderful uh, while many people are working from home to offer Flojo um, for free for researchers who might be utilizing um, shared accounts in the lab and they don't have access from home. So please feel free to utilize that link and we thank Flojo for that initiative. Uh, then we have our Flow Cytometry Core Facility website which is fccf.mskcc.org, where we have recordings of all of the previous sessions that we've had, uh, in addition to uh, more content like flow post-its, SOPs, uh, general announcements, all of that. So we encourage everyone to visit. In addition to our Twitter page, and our handle is at flowmskcc. So there we'll um, announce um, you know, any educational initiatives that we have, we um, share uh, papers and articles that we think are interesting. Um, we also have an educate uh, or a flow cytometry uh, entertainment little series that we've started up as we've been working from home since we really missed the lab um, and we're kind of flow geeks. So we have that up there and we encourage you to visit um, our Twitter. Then we also have the um, ISAC website and um, specifically a link to Cyto University because ISAC's been very wonderful during this time to offer Cyto University for free um, as many people are um, forced to work from home. So we thank them uh, as well for their initiatives there. Um, as we're going through some of this data, um, if we have the time, I might pull in a data set that I've actually pulled from Flow Repository. And Flow Repository is a nice resource if you're trying to figure out how to use this analysis software, you don't have any FCS files, you're new to flow cytometry. Um, I highly encourage you to visit flowrepository.org where there are FCS files from a variety of different um, ex researchers and experiments that you can utilize to, to start taking a look at uh, this, uh, this uh, analysis software. And then a couple more important links. Uh, up top, we also have um, the first one as the Cytometry Part A journal. And everyone's going to get these slides after, so you don't have to go crazy writing anything down. We'll share these slides um, in addition to a recording of the video. 
um, cytometry part A will have a lot of wonderful articles um, regarding cytometry, right? Makes sense. And they also have the um, opti optimized multicolor immunofluorescence panels. They are the OMIPs that you can utilize. Uh, they have a, a wide variety of content we encourage you to visit. Okay. Then we want to um, make sure that everyone is aware of their uh, regional flow cytometry users group. So for us here in New York, New Jersey, and metro area, uh, including Connecticut, we have MetroFlow. And um, just a quick announcement, uh, MetroFlow has put together a corporate member seminar series for um, May 11th to the 15th. So we're gonna be having um, about 28 talks over five days um, by our corporate members. So please feel free to visit that link for more information and to sign up. And then we um, want to make sure that everyone's also aware of Flotex. Um, Flotex is the regional users group down in Texas, and they've been um, wonderful during this work from home time to make sure that there's a lot of educational content available um, to their user base um, and on a, on a broader perspective. And I want to take a second to just congratulate them um, as they worked very, very hard and put together an amazing uh, webinar um, through, through science um, just yesterday, or no, two days ago, I believe, or yesterday, <laughs> um, uh, regarding COVID-19 and um, flow cytometry research, and it was, it was phenomenal. So I applaud them for such an amazing turnout, an amazing uh, webinar in such a short period of time. And lastly, um, the YouTube link at the bottom is just a fun little um, thank you and uh, informational uh, YouTube video uh, provided by David Gravano that shows us how we can turn some text or images to FCS files like you saw with my little question marks on slide one. Okay. So throughout the duration of this talk, I highly encourage everyone to go ahead and um, interrupt with the, uh, via the chat function. So Rui will be monitoring the chat function uh, for any questions that come through. Um, if anything can be answered on his end, he'll go ahead and answer. Um, or if it's warranted that I uh, go through a discussion in the uh, analysis software itself, we will absolutely go through that and, uh, and we'll do our best to answer all questions. So we highly encourage everyone to, to utilize the chat function throughout. We want it to be interactive. Um, but if there's anything you think of after or any, any follow-ups, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, and uh, the, the text did not uh, carry over well, but it's danielk1 at mskcc.org. It's happened to me a few times now, but it's uh, d-a-n-i-e-l-k-1 at mskcc.org. But you'll be getting these slides. Okay. So with that, um, before I get going, uh, the lastly, I just wanted to make sure I thanked our, um, all of our members and our team. They've been um, absolutely amazing, uh, developed a lot of SOPs, educational content, the flow post-its that you'll see that we have on our website and our Twitter. Uh, they've done a phenomenal job in providing a lot of, um, a lot of resources for our facility while we've been working from home. So we've definitely stayed busy and I wanna say thank you um, you know, to our whole group. Okay. So some suggested reading um, and, and some, some links that I'm just gonna show before we get started um, in, the, in the analysis software really quickly um, is first uh, the basic multicolor flow cytometry um, that was put out in the current protocols in immunology in 2017. It's a really nice resource and I highly encourage everyone to check it out um, when they're um, starting to get an idea of um, flow cytometry and what it entails. Um, the reason I bring it up is because it utilizes some best practices that we're gonna be going over today as well. Whether it's checking sample quality, um, the inclusion of viability dyes and why they're so important, FC blocking, um, the use of correct controls, all of these are referenced um, in that current protocols. Um, article and I want to make sure that everyone's aware that it is available to them and um, to, to really give it a good read through. Okay, and then one more reference and you'll recognize this from two weeks ago if you joined us for our characterization talk. Um, there's the immunophenotyping methods and protocols chapter by Farian Mar and Aaron Tisnik where they went into detail on instrument characterization and what you want to keep in mind when um, you're designing a panel and, and best practices there. And some of that's going to also um, be applicable today. So I, want, I would be remiss if I did not mention that. Um, so we wanna say thank you um, 
to, to those uh, wonderful authors for those resources that we have. Okay, with that, I'm gonna go ahead, uh, even though I have one or two more slides uh, I'll reference later, I will get going in the actual software. Okay. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and open up the Flojo software and we'll get started with our first data set. Um, for anyone that's very, very new to Flojo, what I would highly encourage you to do is to go ahead and check out our, um, our website where we have the recordings of these previous sessions. So you can go ahead and, um, and check that out um, if, you're, if you're feeling a little lost at any point and we go over um, all the basics. Okay. Um, so first, I'm just going to go ahead and sign into the portal, which is how we go ahead and access a licensed version of Flojo. So I'm going to sign in. And you'll see it went from unlicensed, um, uh, where you can only drag in demo files, to have the ability um, to utilize the, the fully licensed version. So I have all of my data sets here for today, and we're going to see what we can get through. We do have quite a bit, because there's always, um, there's always availability when we are discussing troubleshooting. Okay. So one of the first things I want to look at is something that's going to be um, a little bit um, basic maybe, but it's, it goes to the, uh, back to the instrument and some of the best practices that we wanna um, keep in mind as we're uh, acquiring our instruments, okay? So I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna drag in my first data set. And most everyone will be aware by now, but if you go ahead and just drag in a folder that has FCS files, it will automatically go ahead and um, populate in the workspace for you. And it'll create a group that has the specific name of that folder, and it'll also put those in all samples. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and delete that extra group because it doesn't uh, need to be there. And when I hit delete uh, on the keyboard, that's all I needed to do, and those samples are still there. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at, um, at this data file right here. I need, it's 222G, and I needed to take a look at my, um, my file that I had ran on the Cytoflex. So the first thing I saw when I opened up is that everything's kind of plateaued or everything's kind of at the edge. And you can see there's a little warning here where it's telling you how many events are on the chart edges. So it's 74%. There are two options here for us to be able to look at this um, and to be able to get a cohesive picture of the whole scaling. And I, I've gone over this in previous sessions, but just a quick remi reminder to everyone, if I double click on this little um, circle right here next to the file, what it's gonna do is it's gonna open up um, a window that goes over the sample properties. And within that, it's going to tell me the range of the detectors. And so you can see for fluorescence and for scatter, the range is actually, actually 16,777,216. It's a bit different um, on these instruments than it is uh, with the Cytoflex and the APD-based um, detectors than it is with uh, the traditional PMT-based detectors, so it's not gonna have the same range. And I have two options now that I know that that value is, um, is higher, right? So it's 16,777,000. I could either come here to the transform button, customize the axis, and I can change this value to that 16777216. The reason I don't always prefer that, <clears throat> excuse me, is because then I'd have to go in and change every single detector um, via the transform button, okay? So I, I don't prefer that. What I prefer doing is going into preferences. And when I go into preferences, if I go into cytometers, what I have the ability to do is I can go to Cytoflex, and I can make sure that um, I actually, as opposed to using, um, um, I can use either custom or default, or I can change the custom um, linear scaling, right? Two million where it was just maxed out out before over here to 16777216, okay? So now when I do that for all um, detectors that I have in linear, it's automatically gonna go to 16777216. This way you don't have to use that transform button each and every time for height, for area, for all these different parameters that you might be looking at for scatter. Okay, now just because I go ahead and I change that detector, um, the detector over to side scatter area or anything like that, it's not automatically gonna populate. So what I have to do is I have to close it out 
I have to um, close the workspace and I'm, I'm not even gonna bother saving it because I didn't really do anything. Um, I'm gonna quit out and I'm gonna open again. You do have to restart Flojo when you make any of these changes, so just keep that in mind. And it takes two seconds, so it's just a nice little thing to, to show everybody. Okay, drag that back in. Now when I go back in here, beautiful. We see the full range of um, the forward and side scatter in linear, um, or any detector in linear is now gonna be at 16777216. So just a nice little reminder. Okay. Now, typically when we're first starting to look um, at, our, at our data, what we typically expect to see is that, you know, you would see potentially the whole range, right? So if, you're, if it's saying that the detector range is 16,777,216, why is it that when I'm looking at this data, everything is kind of within this 5 million range? Okay, the reason for that, um, it's actually something that's, um, that, that has been um, known on this instrument is that it's actually saturating at a certain point. So even though there's the range of uh, zero to 16 million, uh, roughly, we're seeing it's, it's kind of saturating at this point. A good, a good uh, little troubleshooting tip, if I was curious, does it actually happen on all um, measurements of forward scatter and side scatter, or is it strictly, um, just the forward scatter um, height and side scatter height. I can test that quick by coming here and going to forward scatter area. And we can see, all right, it's not really plateauing, it's going out much higher, or it's not saturating, it's going out much higher there. And if I do side scatter area, we can see utilizing that whole range in forward scatter and side scatter area, <clears throat> everything looks fine, the data looks fine, right? But does that mean that it's a good choice to have the detector settings as they were for this experiment, okay? So if I was thinking about that, what I would, what I would go through in my brain is to say, all right, well, let me do some initial gating. I'll, 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 I'll gate on my scatter, I'll gate on my singlets, and you know, if it works, even though it's saturated, I, is it okay? Um, so uh, uh, I'll show you really quick now, if we go to the polygon, and these are the different gating options right here. We have rectangular, quadrant, elliptical, um, polygon. You can go ahead and, and use, um, sorry, uh, this little pencil polygon gate right here, which I don't really use often. Um, the auto gating based on the density and everything like that. There's um, multiple options, but I'm gonna go ahead and use polygon. And because I haven't looked at a viability gate yet, I'm just gonna go ahead and assume all of these are alive because we need a viability guide to really make sure. So we don't wanna exclude anything just yet. Every click is a node and I click on that last node. I'm gonna just call that scatter because I'm not exactly sure what cells these are. If I double click, it opens up to the, our gated population, our daughter um, population, our child population. And here, I, I wanna next um, gate on my single cells. So if I come here, um, we can look at side scatter area on the x-axis and side scatter height on the y. And I need to be able to accurately determine by looking at height versus area where my single cells are. I am immediately running into a problem here because how can I accurately gate where my single cells are? Typically what you wanna see is you would wanna see a population where the height and the area are proportional to each other for single cells. And as two cells go through together at the same time, what winds up happening is you have a higher area or width than you do um, height. Um, or you can kind of mix up how you utilize it um, by as long as you're looking at the same detector, right? So you can look at side scatter height versus side scatter area. You can look at side scatter height versus side scatter width side scatter area versus side scatter width, right? There are all these different options that you can choose from, but what I'm seeing here immediately is that I can no longer use side scatter height versus area because I reached saturation on that um, uh, side scatter height. And everything is plateauing at this point. And if I wanted to set up a gate like I typically would for singlets, how can I accurately determine where the singlets are once it's plateaued down here. So I'm not gonna be able to do that, right? I'm gonna cancel out this gate. What I can do is I can actually go ahead and make sure that when I'm at the instrument, 
I utilize the correct detector settings to make sure that I don't see a phenomenon such as this. So I have an example here of um, uh, acquisition at a gain of uh, 222 for forward scatter, 201, 137, um, and 137 uh, again, respectively. That's for forward scatter. And then we also, um, I just named it by that, we also adjusted the side scatter uh, detectors. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to open up one of the detectors where we actually adjusted the actual settings on the instrument uh, and, the, and the gain on the instrument. When I change this to forward scatter area and side scatter area, we can see it's definitely a bit different when we're looking at that full scaling of 16,777,000. If I, if I just drag this scatter gate up to all samples and I'm a little bit more um, open there on the gating, right, to try and include uh, a similar number of cells, right, as, as close as I can get. When I double click there, what I can see is I can now much more accurately uh, determine where my single cells are. And what you can also do is you can make sure that you can um, kind of zoom in a bit to get a better um, visual inspection of where those cells lie so you can draw a bit, of, a bit of a better gate. So then I can come back in and I can use my transform and I can customize the axis and I can change the max to about 5 million. When I do that and I change that for the sample where I know I'm not no longer um, reaching the plateau or the saturation point of the height, what I can see is I'm going to be able to do a much better determination of my single cells and you're not going to see the point where it's going to uh, reach that uh, saturation. This looks a little bit um, a little bit deceiving here because what you can see on the on the left that's the one where we didn't change those detector settings and the one on the right is where we did but what you do have if i choose this little rectangular gate oops, i really make sure i'm including everything i have quite a bit that's off scale that i'm not even able to to visualize right if i have everything within the range where the height is not saturated so this is a good example of um of making sure you understand your instrument and you know what you're looking for so that you can accurately um gate and get reliable gating from the cells that you're working with okay if i go back to that um so that slide deck I originally had, I can show you a quick reference here um, from cytometry part A just um, uh, about a month, a month and a half ago, where um, they discussed with, um, with, with Baumic et al, um, and apologies for any mispronunciations, um, they specifically discussed characterization of the cytoflex and the, detection, uh, the saturation of height um, across um, not only scatter, but fluorescent detectors as well. So I highly encourage everyone to utilize this, um, this resource of this article that goes uh, in depth into Cytoflex characterization if you do have an instrument um, such as that in your facility. So this is just the one example there that um, I wanted to bring up to show you uh, the major differences that can occur if you don't have the detector settings. Um, correctly and, and saturation of the signal. Okay. So that's one example. Go ahead, I'll save that workspace really quick in case we want to reference it later. And for anyone that's not aware, when you go to file, you can uh, either just hit um, save or save as on the workspace. Uh, you can save something as a template if you want to come back and, and use it as a reference for uh, analysis with other FCS files later. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and just save it as a workspace. And I'm going to save it always in the same place where my FCS files are, right? So it's right ahead, and it's the height area signal. I'm just going to call that training right there. So the reason we save the workspace the same place the FCS files are is that when you open it up, it knows automatically um, to bring those FCS files in from the same folder. Okay. 
So now our next um, topic that we're going to be discussing is um, troubleshooting some uh, titration data. And I'm actually going to utilize um, this opportunity to also be able to show you uh, a cool plugin that um, I haven't showed in the past sessions, but I think it's a good opportunity to show it now. Okay. So I'm going to close out of this workspace, you can save any changes, and then we'll do a new one. Okay. So I have these antibody titration files. I'm going to go ahead and drag them in. And I have the comp controls here, and I have the, um, the actual um, titrated uh, or titration samples right here. To make things a little bit easier for myself, what I typically like to do is, um, is create a group for each antibody so that everything can be nice and clean and separated. So I'm going to go ahead and create a group just for CD3. Okay. And then I'm going to create a group for CD45. Okay, because those are the two antibodies from this um, titration set. When I come uh, either to the, the folder, uh, the, the group that was named after the folder, all samples, it has the same samples. So I'm just going to delete that one. And then I'm going to um, drag in uh, the CD3 spleen into that CD3 group. You can see now it has four samples there. I can also add the, um, the unstained there as well. Um, nice reference. Drag in. Did not go in. Okay, I'll just have to take a look at that. Uh, and then also the CD45, I can drag up to, to CD45. Okay. So I'm not sure why that one's not going in there. I'll have to take a closer look at that a little bit later. So sometimes every once in a while, bizarre things will happen and I'll take a closer look. Um, when I get the time, let's try this, the Daffy. The Daffy, Daffy went in. Uh, interesting. Okay, so uh, for anyone that was with us for our first session, we went over how to go ahead and uh, titrate antibody um, and how to analyze that data in Flojo. I'm going to show you a, a little bit of a better trick for that today, and then we're also going to analyze that data. So I'm going to go ahead and open up Sorry, a question or, okay, maybe just uh, unmute for a second. Okay, so what I like to do first, um, I'm going to go ahead and look at um, a DAPI, which is our, our viability marker, and then I'm going to look at EOPRO, uh, which the, uh, this utilize, uh, user utilized for, um, for um, apoptotic cells. Okay, I'm going to come into the transform button. I'm going to customize the axis. I'm going to change it to by X. Okay, and I can adjust that width basis a little bit. Okay. I like to make sure that all like my scaling looks correct. And typically when we're looking at multi-parametric data um, off of the uh, Diva instruments, I'll look at it in BIX. And you can see once I make those changes and adjust the width basis, mm -hmm. it looks much, much cleaner. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead now and I'm going to take a look at the live cells. Okay. I'm going to do a quick polygon gate. Those might be some more autofluorescent cells. Um, I'll include them. I'll close that up. I'm going to call those live cells, potentially. Um, I would love to uh, reference my, my unstained spleen here. So let me just go back up to all samples. I'm not sure why it wasn't dragging into that group. And I can go ahead and open that one up just to make sure that with the unstained, that's an appropriate gating. Because we always want to use the appropriate controls whenever possible. So it looks like this actually is a, a perfect example and, and something I wanted to bring up. If you don't have a true unstained, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to set the appropriate gates. So whenever we say unstained, that doesn't mean the inclusion of um, viability dye, apoptotic uh, markers. Uh, sometimes people might come and they, they'll say that this is an unstained line, but it's actually uh, including a fluorescent protein or something along those um, lines. And we want to make sure that whenever um, you're utilizing controls, we want to make sure we're mindful of the language that we use. Because all cells do have autofluorescence. There's, um, there's molecules in the cells that will be excited by certain laser lines and emit, typically uh, within the 400 to, to 550 uh, range or so. Um, and that's a, a general range, but just be mindful that we want to make sure that we have a, a good understanding of where our autofluorescence is. Okay. 
Um, so I'm, I'm assuming in this case, uh, the, the unstained actually just meant that they um, went ahead and, and put in the viability and the um, apoptotic marker. Okay. So I'm going to open that up. And then from there, um, we go back to the, the CD3 group. What I want to look at is I'll look at forward scatter versus side scatter. Okay. And this is a little bit of a, of a tough prep. We're not sure. It's, it's a little bit hard to tell there where our debris is and where our cells is our cells are rather. And um, what we can do uh, in situations like this, and then we have a flow posted on this, is we can actually go ahead and we can include um, a marker to make sure that we're pulling out live cells, um, you know, such as calcium or, or, um, or something like that. There are markers available to us to make sure that we have metabolically active cells that are pulled out and there aren't just um, debris or, or dead cells, right? Because when we're trying to pull out debris from cells, it's going to be uh, sometimes very difficult by scatter. And the inclusion of um, some of these vital, vital markers will help us dramatically in pulling out our populations. Okay. Um, Kathy, can I just interrupt a little bit? Yeah. Um, well, first to remind everyone that if you have any questions to, to go to the chat and, and, and post those questions. The other thing is that, um, you know, feel free to also ask um you know not only technical questions about flojo but if you have any conceptual questions like you know why are we looking at doublets um you know why are we discriminating doublets or viability um, um you know just feel free to to post that if this is something that goes a little bit out of the scope um i can i can answer in the chat we don't have to interrupt but if it's something relevant we can interrupt um, and, and kathy can answer for you guys yes absolutely um that's a it's a very valid point um you know, because I'm going through all this, and we've done some previous uh, sessions really on the, the, the analysis, but we're trying to focus a little bit more today on, from an experimental standpoint, what can go wrong and how do we, how do we pick up on that? Um, you know, and we're, we're getting the added benefit of utilizing Flojo and, uh, and learning Flojo as we go along. So if I'm, if I'm not sure and I have to go along an assumption that these are my, all my cells, if I don't have a vital marker, I can create a gate um, and call it scatter, right? And then I can go ahead and I can take these two gates that I've created and I can drag that up to everything from, CD, uh, from the CD3 group. If I lost that previous uh, plot that I had uh, gated my live cells on, I could always do up to parent population and go back and get that uh, plot visible to me. Typically what I'll do from there is I'll go ahead and I'll scroll through by hitting the shift key and then the little green arrow right here. And when I do that, it's automatically um, changing these to the appropriate um, samples. And it's, it's allowing me to do a quick gating check as I go along, okay? So we've already learned two things. We've learned that we have to use the, uh, and utilize the appropriate controls and make sure that we're naming them correctly so that we actually do have a good understanding of what we're looking at. And we learned that, you know, we want to make sure that when we're looking at unstained, to get an idea of autofluorescence, that there's truly no dye in there, or else it can get very confusing to define positive and negative. Okay. So from there, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to open up scatter. I'm going to do a, a singlet gate, and I'm going to look at uh, forward scatter area by forward scatter height for this. Now, what I mentioned earlier was that uh, the area will be a little bit um, uh, bigger than the height if we're looking at those two parameters or if I'm looking at uh, forward scatter area and width those are also some aggregates right there because the width and the area are impacted as you have Q cells going through um, the laser beam at the same time because they're aggregates okay I typically uh, suggest that people go ahead and uh, scroll through all the different options and see what uh, best fits their data for this, I think that the height and area is okay. I'm gonna call those my single cells. See, we have a good discussion going on up there, so that's exciting. Um, and then from there, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna look at the CD3 antibody. Okay, so this is the uh, control. And because I have a single cell gate, I'm gonna, I'm gonna drag that up, give that a quick check. Everything's good. Okay. Can, I, can I actually, while you're doing that, ask a, a question here? So th there was a question raised that um, um, whether the scatter gate is necessary at all. Um, 
it seems that um, John from Flojo said that um, Scattergate would not be required in some cases or um, um, the question was also, can we set up a, a Scattergate based on a value? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the meaning of Scattergate based on value. What I will say yeah. is that um, exclusion of debris is gonna be very important if you want accurate statistics, okay? Because if you have a high amount of debris in your sample, likely that's going to be negative for whatever uh, markers that you're looking at and it's going to, to skew. Um, it's, it's going to, to make it a little bit messier. Also, when we're talking about antibody titration, we're really trying to identify the point at which your, um, your cells of interest and the cells that have the marker that you're looking for reach that uh, saturation point of the antibody binding to the receptors on or within the cells. And you are looking for the point where this, uh, this negative cells start shifting up. The, the data will be a bit skewed if you start including all of the debris in that um, because you're not getting a good idea uh, from that perspective of when your um, when your negative cells are having all of this excess antibody bound to it through oversaturation in the shift up. So I would um, always suggest to make sure that you remove your debris before you move forward with analysis. Yeah, and in terms of the value, I think um, uh, what this person means is that, um, you know, like if you have a certain, let's say uh, in the scale, if it's the value 256 on the x-axis, you know, is that high for forward scatter or low for forward scatter? And I guess the answer is um, no, um, uh, it's, it's a relative scale. So you can actually increase the gains and put the scatter, whatever you want. Um, so, so there's not gonna be a value where you're going to use as a discriminating whether, um, you know, you have a, a very high scatter or not. Yeah, and um, uh, an another, just quick reminder is that, you know, if we look back to that Cytoflex data that we just showed, you can easily change where everything falls, just like Bruce said, based off of how you set the gain or how you set the voltage, depending on which instrument you're on. Um, so you can easily um, pull up and, and show some, um, some big differences there. And actually that, that will make sense for the next data set I bring on, uh, I bring in that shows, um, you know, it, it, it's hard to determine sometimes without an appropriate scatter gate, um, you know, the right statistics. Yeah, yeah and, and exactly, that's very true. And, and it's important to understand that scatter, um, the scatter plot is probably one of the most difficult plots to interpret, um, especially if you're a novice in full cytometry. Um, so it's, it's um, you know, it just seems a, a huge cloud and it's hard to distinguish between debris, uh, live dead um, cells, the cells that are activated, et cetera, right? So like Kathy was saying, we need to use other, um, that's why we use fluorescence to distinguish between these cells. Um, but then it's, it's, it's important to go back to the scatter and sometimes we do it through backgating to clean up the scatter so that not only in terms of statistics, but also in terms of the identifying populations, uh, it becomes much easier. Yes, absolutely. And um, I think if we have time towards the end, I can reference back also to um, a flow post that we have about uh, vital dyes and why they can become very important, for example, like in this experiment here, um, because you can have a, a scatter, um, they could be overlaid. You can have um, large debris and small cells and it's very hard to pull out or impossible to pull out just by uh, scatter gating. Okay. Um, so this example, uh, if we're good to move forward, is uh, you know, CD3, right? So, if I go through and I scroll through, you can see that CD3 is, is shifting up, right? So we went from our um, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, and 0.8 micrograms um, per mil, okay? So I've shown in previous sessions, the first session actually in our introductory section, um, how to go ahead and, and do manual gating and how to manually do statistics. I'm gonna show you a plugin that you can get on the Flojo Exchange today. And I'm not gonna go into details on how to um, download um, the plugins and how to, how to put it in the software. Please reference the, the last session uh, recording for that. Or if anyone has a question, I can show you very briefly towards the end. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna um, highlight uh, the single cell gate now that I have it all gated. I'm gonna go to workspace and plugin. And these are the plugins that I have specifically on this computer. The only one that we're gonna be reviewing today is um, stain index. So if you go ahead and, and choose stain index, it's just telling me that I need to make sure I 
save the workspace. I'm going to hit yes. I'm going to go to my antibody titration. Okay, I'll leave that name. That's fine. And then it's telling me I need to choose what the parameter is that I'm trying to do the stain index off of. That parameter is going to be off by CD3, right? So the, it's the APC size 7. I choose that detector. And then you have the option of either having pre-gated or for it to automatically find the gate for you. So I'm going to choose auto find and, and we'll see how it looks. I'm going to hit OK. And all of the statistics that I had showed everyone how to do manually, we can now look at how it, um, at how it um, generate, generates automatically. It's always important that you have an understanding of what you're doing and why you're doing it, which is why we went over it previously. But if I open up the single cells now, you can see, all right, I have CD3, I don't see any gates. That's because it does it based off of a histogram. So if I start typing in histogram based on the, um, when I go to change the y-axis, it is, oh, I made a mistake actually. This is a really good troubleshooting example. I didn't choose the comp of, uh, of CD3, so it's not gonna choose the correct because it was in a multicolor. So I'm gonna close out of that. I apologize. I'm gonna delete the stain index and all of these parameters by just hitting shift. And I'm gonna delete this table right there that little minus button. So I'm gonna go back in, I'm gonna do a plugin, so I'm gonna go to stain index. And now if I go down, so you have uncomped and you have comped. So we always wanna make sure when you're multicolor and you have comp data that you, you choose the correct one. Hit okay, go back over, wasn't too painful, right? Now it automatically did not do the best job. Sorry about that. Um, I unplugged the phone before this, but I think the power is, yeah. is low. So the, um, which we'll call it? So the positive gate and the negative gate are off, right? So it did its, it the best it could, and sometimes it's usually pretty good, but this is off. So I'm gonna take this positive gate right here, I'm gonna drag it up, and then here, the negative is actually kind of down towards the axis, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm going to hit this little transform button, customize the axis, change this to by x. I'm going to try and get a little bit of a better view on that on negative. Now there's the chance if I had had that scaling a little bit better when I started that it automatically would have found a better, uh, a better um, identification of those populations. So you can go ahead and um, yep, replace that a little bit of a better job identifying those populations. So I'm gonna come in here. Oops, I'm just trying to adjust that one gate. And now I have my positive and negative gating all squared away. I'm gonna take this stain index analysis and I'm gonna drag it up to all single cells. Okay, we're gonna hit um, yes that we wanna replace. Oop. Now it made it all the same, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna, so I hit yes to replace that node. Um, I'm going to go through, I'm going to toggle through, and it automatically sets them all the same spot. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to adjust them. And as I'm doing that, all I have to do is a quick adjustment of those gates. To make sure um, that I'm gating my positive and negative. Now, I don't love using histograms to be able to pull out positive and negative. Because what you'll see is when you have a histogram, you have a distribution of the data one way, and you have a distribution of this population the other way. It's going to be a little bit harder to pull out the positive and the negative, but for, um, to, to show you how this plugin works and how you get the stain index in this way, this is a, um, it's sufficient for today. Now, it automatically goes ahead and pulls in the stats that are needed, the robust standard deviation, the MFI, the positive, um, the MFI the negative and also the, um, the robust standard deviation is of the negative. It automatically creates the formula. I've discussed how to create in previous sessions. And what we can do if we go to um, table editor, right, is we can make sure that we can um, specify that we only want CD3 group to be calculated. And you can either create a table to display, to file, to the layout, to clipboard. There are all these different options to you, but I'm gonna go ahead and create it to the table, okay? And what you can see here, right, is that we have um, 
the 0.1 micrograms per mil, 0.2, 0.4, 0 0.8, and the DAPI doesn't, we don't, we don't need to analyze that, right? Because it doesn't matter for us. There's no CD3 in there. This is just a higher autofluorescent population it picked up. And what happens with the stain index goes from five to 8.3, 8.4, 8.5. So it's never reaching saturation. Our end goal when we're doing titration of antibody is to see the point where our positive uh, is plateauing and the negative starts to come up. And we can tell at that point through the statistical analysis that we've reached saturation, okay? I can show you all very quickly how we can very easily visualize that. So if I go ahead and I go to uh, single cells, I can either right click and um, choose select equivalent nodes, or I can use the appropriate shortcut keys. Or uh, alternatively, I can um, come to edit and select equivalent nodes. And then when you do that, you can always right click and um, you can concatenate those populations together. And I'm gonna show you a very quick view of how we can see that this titration was incorrect in the sense that it did not add in enough antibody and the dilution range was not appropriate to calculate the appropriate uh, titration or the optimal concentration. So I'd hit concatenate there and you can change the name here. You can also, um, in the destination right up here, change where you want it to go. So I'm gonna have it go in uh, where it's supposed to be in the antibody titration. I'm gonna have it say antibody titration CD3. And I concatenate it and put it in the existing workspace. Okay, it's complete. I can close it up. And when I do that, what I'll see if I click right there, it already has all the gating from the previous samples. On the x-axis, I'm gonna change it to sample ID. And on the y, I'm gonna change it to CD3. Okay, so what we're seeing is the CD3 positives are continuing to go up and you're not really seeing much of a shift up or, or, or significant spread of the negative, okay? We always want to rely on the statistics, not on visual inspection to choose antibody concentration when we're doing titration. And this is a good example of um, a couple of different things. It's an example of controls. It's an example of not having the appropriate starting concentration and dilution range. Um, and you know, also um, why we wanna make sure that we include um, a vital dye potentially if there's a lot of debris, okay? So that's titration example. Uh, Kathy, should you mention something about, um, you know, washing, for instance, you know, possible causes of, of spread in the negative that may not be necessarily due to the, to, to unspecific antibody binding? Yeah, so you absolutely do want to uh, wash the appropriate uh, amount. And what we've uh, found um, based on initial um, checks is that that can actually be a little bit dependent on the fluorochromes that you're choosing to utilize in your experiments. So, um, uh, you know, you want to make sure that you sufficiently wash. Don't just do like a half wash or a one wash. Um, wash at least two to three times and uh, be mindful of the dyes that you're working with. We, um, we're currently looking to explore a little bit more on the polymer dyes, the, the super brights, the, the brilliants, um, to really get um, uh, some good data together on, on what's sufficient versus not to make sure that we're removing any nonspecific binding there for those polymer dyes. Um, but in general, it's best practice to make sure that you wash efficiently. This is just an example. We're not really seeing um, anything too crazy, but we're, we're not getting to the point where we're seeing um, a decrease of that separation index as we increase the concentration. And what I, uh, what I would suggest to do to start off with is to start off at 10 micrograms per mil and do uh, about seven to eight serial fold dilutions down, uh, two fold dilutions down. That, uh, is that good, Rui? Is there any other questions on that section? No, that's good. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to do one more um, kind of organically shift over to that discussion about debris and scatter, and then we're going to run into uh, or jump into some compensation. Okay. So that one is right here. I'm going to drag that in. I just want to do a very quick analysis here to show why gating is so important. And um, this is something that had happened on, um, on an instrument that um, I, I was made aware of after the fact. 
And what wound up happening is I want to show you the difference of, of how gating can actually have an impact on end populations, uh, especially, you know, it's, it's one thing if you're doing analysis, but if you're sorting, you have to be very mindful that as you're doing your um, controls, as you're setting your gates and all of that, it, it's going to impact the number of cells that you get back. Okay, so we always have to make sure that you're confident in what you've um, in what you put in place to to physically isolate and get cells back if you want um, reliable results. So this is a really good example here because what do we see straight away? We see straight away that there's a warning right here that 88% of the events are on the chart edges. Uh, so this is someone that was um, utilizing for, um, you know, one of the sorters um, that we have and they were running an experiment. And after the fact, they came back and they had 88% that was on the edges. Okay, so even if I hit that transform button, I customize, I try to add more, that's the max for this detector. 250,000. So I can't go ahead and change the scaling to bring these um, in like I did with the Cytoplex. Okay. And what wound up happening is they said, oh, these are my cells. Do a little scatter gate right there, pretty tight. And I'm going to do this relatively quickly. You can see how much debris there is there. Okay. Do a quick singlet gate. Clojo is smart, it automatically said those are your single cells based on the parameters I chose. And then what they were looking to do, they were looking for live cells that were Alexa 700 positive. Okay, come in here, I'm going to customize the axis. Again, I think everyone is going to think I sound like a broken record if you've heard me in these sessions before. But I don't always have the appropriate controls for these classrooms because we're locked out of the lab <laughs> um, uh, for just a very tiny bit longer now. And um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of access to everything I would like. Okay. But um, these down here are the negatives. These are the Alexa 700 population uh, of interest that they wanted. So I'm going to say cells of interest right here. So it's 90.6%. This is how they went ahead and did their gating, and they, this is how they, um, they went ahead and, um, and sorted their cells. Okay. I'm going to show you an alternative approach that I would take. Um, one, I would adjust the forward and uh, side scatter voltages, kind of like I showed you for the Cytoflex. I would do something similar there to make sure it's within the appropriate range and also on scale uh, a bit more. But now that we have this one up, I'm going to show you an alternative method. So I'm going to open up that same file, and as opposed to starting off with a forward scatter, side scatter, I'm actually going to start off with the Alexa 700 on the y-axis and the DAPI on the x-axis. Okay. Again, we always want to make sure we have the appropriate controls. I'm going to be pretty tight. Um, those are likely some cells that um, have started to get the, the DAPI in if the, the membrane is starting to become permealized a bit. Um, you want to be very mindful when you're adding DAPI, how much you add and when you add it, because it will eventually, because it's a cell permeable dye, will get in. But I'm going to say that those are my cells of interest that I'm starting off with here. Double click, open up. I'm going to do forward scatter area versus height. Okay. Be a little bit more broad with this scatter gating, or with the singlet gating rather but most of my cells are, are really right about there. This is a um, pretty, pretty good uh, singlet gate, and we could always do a double uh, doublet exclusion as well. But for the sake of time, not doing that today, I'm gonna double click there, and then I'm gonna look at forward scatter and side scatter, okay? So then, here's an example where maybe I'm, maybe I'm not gonna use a scatter gate to pull out, uh, to exclude debris. Because I looked at my marker of interest and because I looked at um, my marker of interest versus DAPI and I pulled that out, I was able to exclude most of, uh, most of the crud and stuff I wasn't looking at. Now, if I come down here, that debris was all kind of right down there, right? This isn't always the case where it pulls out so nice. So I know the, the, um, the researcher before was asking about um, importance of debris exclusion and everything like that. We have to be very mindful based on the experiments and what our end goal is and what we're looking to, um, to, to get out of it. So now, someone might look at this and say, okay, what's the big deal? 
right? What, what does it really matter? The reason why this is so important, how you gate and what, you, um, what you're looking at, and, and you have to be very mindful of how you set your voltages and how you set your population um, gates, is because the, the user that was sorting their cells went through and they did it based on scatter, single cell, cells of interest. And if you look here, um, the uh, number of cells that come out of the same file is 3785. If we start off with the, you know, the scatter gating, right, just like that, assume that those are all of our cells right there, which is just what they did. And then single cells and our cells of interest based on fluorescence versus 5,632 if we did fluorescence first and then looked at our singlets and then um, you know, verified that there was no debris there. So it's going to be very critical to make sure that we um, are setting our voltages correctly for, for scatter, for fluorescence, for all of that. We don't wanna see very high numbers off scale or anything like that. And we also wanna make sure that we're not being so tight on our scatter gating without understanding what that does. Because if you're sorting these cells, that's almost two, like a, a, a twofold, right? That's, a, that's, almost, that's a huge difference. We're going from 3,785 to 5,632. And if you're working with rare cells and if you're working with a population that you're gonna have a hard time trying to pull out, that's not gonna, um, that's not gonna do, uh, do you very well for your downstream applications when you're trying to have a certain number of cells to work with. And I could always come in and, and show you quick if I if I do a quick overlay, um, the difference in, in scatter there and the, and those cells. So if I drag in that those cells of interest right there, right, I double click here and the x-axis I look at forward scatter and the y-axis I look at side scatter, and I hit OK. Right, this is where um, if I was tight on that scatter gating, but if I was a little bit um, if I thought a little bit differently about my gating strategy, I came in there's a difference there, okay? Might be hard for somebody to see where those original cells were, so what we can do is we can click right here and drag it up, and you can see that difference. So you have all of these cells that are pulling out that you initially went ahead and, and or the user rather, or the researcher, um, went ahead and they were so tight on their gating that they got half the amount of cells almost that they were really looking for. So, um, and half is a little exaggeration, but it's still, every cell is going to be important. Um, for certain applications, so you have to be very mindful of that. Okay, and again, I keep saying this, but I know I'm going fast through some things. It's because we um, went ahead and, and reviewed these in previous sessions, and I highly encourage everyone to take a look at on our uh, website. So I'm going to save that workspace. Okay, and then we're going to go ahead and we're going to take a look at some titration or um, some uh, compensation rather. Mm -hmm. So this is a really good example um, that, um, you know, I can imagine that many people have been in the scenario where you have an experiment that you've run, right, and it's taken a lot of time and you've prepared so many controls, right, you might have, um, you might have 15 or 20 different single color controls based on how many, um, you know, parameters are in your experiment. There's all these, um, you have all this different stuff to do in the lab, you're pressed for time. And I, I've seen it mentioned quite a bit. Oh, I can just reuse my comp from when I originally set it up. I don't need to run comp controls. I don't, I don't need to, to run any of that. Is that okay? Okay, no. <laughs> um, there's not really much leeway there. That's not something um, I, or the flow cytometry uh, core facility at Memorial Sloan Kettering ever suggest. Um, you could have in-depth conversations with Rui and, I, Rui and I about it, but I'm going to show you why that's um, so important not to do now. Okay, so if I, if I come ahead, uh, go ahead and I um, take a look at the compensation for this file, all I have to do is just quickly double check on this grid, and it's going to open up the acquisition defined compensation. So at times, people might go ahead and they might duplicate an experiment from their initial run or have a template of their experiment from their initial run with compensation values saved. And what will happen is something like this, right? If I look at APC versus per CP, overcomped. 
and the, the teal is your um, the teal is your original and the and the black is your compensated. You also see here am cyan and APC size seven. You have this pattern if you follow my mouse where everything is kind of completely going down over compensation, right? So these are all patterns that we're we're used to seeing. And this is from um, you know an example from when someone was adamant, I can just reuse my old comp. It's fine. It doesn't matter. Okay. So I want to show you why it actually does matter. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do the gating as they would have done for that experiment. What they did first was they took a look at scatter, right? So there's a couple of different populations here. It's hard to tell what's what. I'm go ahead, try and exclude what I believe is, is debris there. And there is a viability gating in this one that we're going to check out. So I'm going to call that scatter. Then from there, we're going to look at our singlet gate. And remember, we can use forward scatter, side scatter, we can use multiple parameters. Single cells. Then they wanted their FITC positive and PE negative. Okay. Using this transform button and adjusting the width basis is gonna be helpful. So I customize the axis here, bring this width basis down so we can get a better visualization. Okay, try and pull that out a little bit better. So right now, things aren't looking absolutely the best, but it's, it's really not looking bad. Okay, so again, just referencing my little gating strategy here. Um, they wanted a FITC positive, PE negative, making a little bit of a guess there. So I have that right there. And then they had per CP versus Fitzy, and they wanted the um, double positive there. Again, just uh, I'm I'm not going based off of um, control here. I just want to show you the the reason why this is so important. Okay, APC size seven and APC. I might I missed out on one gate for. Um, for viability, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and draw that back in, and this is the population of interest. Okay, so this is the population of interest. I did forget to include the um, single, uh, the, the viability gate that was based off of AMP cyan. And what you can see, we have a lot of extreme negatives, okay? That should always be a red flag for you. So if I come in and I adjust this transform, and I adjust that width basis, I see extreme negatives here. That's always indicative, and that always, um, or indicative to me, of inappropriate compensation and something went wrong, okay? So whenever I see that, that's a red flag. And um, for this experiment, what they did, they plotted it versus forward scatter, and they set the gate right about there, and they called those live. I'm just gonna move rest of these down there. Okay. I'm going to delete those. So now I have my, my live cell included. Okay, and then I'm just going to double check my FITCPE. Okay. For CP. Okay. So now we have the live cells included. This data to me, whenever you see anything that looks like this that has extreme negatives, I always want you to be mindful and take a look. Now, um, went ahead and um, convinced, um, you know, to, to look at the appropriate controls and um, to go ahead and, and get those single color controls and take a look at the compensation then. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna um, just, as opposed to showing compensation and, and wasting time and, and how to calculate it in Flojo, I'm gonna show you how to import a matrix. So this user, um, you know, I just resaved uh, the compensation matrix. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna double click here. And what we can do, this is the acquisition defined matrix. And I'm gonna go ahead and add in a previously saved matrix that I had used to correct this with the appropriate controls. So I'm gonna hit add. I'm gonna hit from file. I have it right on the desktop here. Okay. Okay. Virtual classroom. 
adjusted comp matrix. I'm going to open that up. And when I come here, it sees a big difference, right, in how those how that n by n looks. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to drag that in. Once I drag that adjusted comp that was actually carried out appropriately, uh, what's going to happen is all of these gates are going to have to be adjusted now, and the population percentages can actually um, be altered. So if I go ahead and I adjust this transform because I no longer have all of those extreme negatives, right, I'm able to pull out much better now without that all that uh, the 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 extreme negatives and everything. I'm actually able to pull out in a much more defined way where my negative, my positive fall. Okay. Then from there, I can go ahead and I can look at the rest of the populations. Okay. And when I did a deep analysis for this, um, what I actually found um, when, I, when I took a close look and I did a very, very strict gating exactly how they did in their experiment, the population uh, of interest uh, actually almost doubled. It went from um, you know, roughly about 0 0.8, 0 0.9 with a fine tune analysis of how they originally did it to about 1.7, 1.8. When you're looking at rare populations, again, I'm going to sound like a parrot here, but you have to be very careful of all the decisions that you make, because if you just decide to go ahead and reuse old comp and say, it's fine, it doesn't matter, you can wind up um, very easily gating incorrectly and, um, and having populations um, that do not make sense. Your statistics won't make sense when we're talking about those extreme negatives and all of that. Um, you know, it's just not going to be appropriate for your analysis. So this is my lesson in assuming that you can utilize previously used compensation matrices, right? We see very clear issues with the compensation. We see super negatives. We see a lot of issues there. And then once we are running the appropriate controls and redo the cal uh, compensation calculation, that's gone. Okay, so be very mindful of that and do not reuse compensation controls. Okay, were there any questions on, on that one, Marie? Well, yes, actually, um, that was exactly the question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> why does this happen when applying old compensation values, essentially? Okay, so why does it happen? That's a very good question. That, there's gonna be two different parts to that. One, these instruments that we run are not exactly the same from day to day. Whenever you run comp, uh, whenever you run the instrument, unless you're doing a very strict stand, um, you know, longitudinal study where you're setting target values and all of that, there's going to be um, uh, changes from from day to day in how the experiment uh, instrument operates. You're going to have a change in where the 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 target, uh, the, the beads fall, you're gonna have like modifications to um, voltages that need to be made for it to hit targets because it's gonna drift, right? There's gonna be slight changes from day to day. We also have, we all have different moods from day to day. Our cytometers kind of have different moods and they're not gonna be exactly falling into the same place from day to day. When we're talking about compensation, it relies on us um, having appropriate um, understanding of positive and negative populations from a primary um, channel and the spillover into adjacent detectors. So if the instrument, uh, when we throw the same sample on, is gonna throw those populations in different areas, even if it's my, uh, you know, a small change, that's gonna result in errors in compensation. Alternatively, what you can have, um, if you're thinking of uh, the fluorochromes and the way they operate, the, you can have tandem dye degradation. You can have um, differences of intensity um, from day to day in your uh, experimental samples, right? That you need to make sure that you're taking into account that you have the appropriate controls for. So from a technical perspective from the instrument itself and also from a um, perspective of our actual samples, we need to make sure that all of our ducks are in a row and that we have, um, we have the appropriate controls under the appropriate conditions so that we can accurately cal calculate the compensation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so I'll save that one. I'm going to be under use comp values, okay. Another example I have is actually, you know, we've talked a lot about um, like scatter scaling and everything like that. 
Um, I have an example also of off-scale fluorescence. So what wound up happening is, um, you know, run the controls, everything looks good, right? The single colors are all great. And then once you go ahead and once you take a look at the actual um, experiment itself um, and the experimental sample itself, there can be changes there, right? And why does it matter, right? If, if my single color is on scale and everything looks good with it, but then my fully stained is off scale, right? There's gonna be implications there with compensation and also um, for uh, accurate determination of statistics. So if I take a look at this file and I double click on that comp matrix, this is from another experiment, what I immediately see is a mess, right? There are issues with this compensation. So what I see is I see over comp, I see over comp, and I also very clearly see off scale data, okay? That off scale data is actually um, causing incorrect compensation and is causing extreme negatives in multiple detectors, not that you would necessarily expect. Okay, so this is a BV650, and if I, uh, and you can see right here, because it says CompQ.655, they just didn't uh, rename the detector, the parameter. So if I um, double click and I open that up, I'll make this a little bit bigger. When I come here and I look at um, the, this detector, what I see, you have 22% that's off scale. Okay, that is no good. And what we talked about from our previous discussion, just about compensation, was the need to make sure that not only are we running our single colors, but that our single colors are actually appropriate for what we're looking to do. Because if the, um, you know, when we're taking a look at this, if you have off-scale data, the compensation isn't going to be correct. This is a very brief example. I don't really have to do much analysis in Flojo. It's really just showing you um, by opening up this n by n plot in this compensation. Uh, window, how you can very easily identify where the problem is, okay? Because there's going to be um, extreme uh, overcompensation that winds up with this population. So if you can see um, uh, BV650 versus the DAPI here, when I take a look at that, BV650 versus DAPI, what's happening? You're having that overcompensation and if I wasn't thinking of BV650 versus DAPI and I was just looking at DAPI that's where that extreme negative is coming from. There are multiple reasons that extreme negatives can actually uh, occur the main culprit or or super negatives can occur the main culprit really is through the use of um through the use of a uh, Sorry, I had unplugged the main phone. I don't know why it keeps going off. Um, so the, the main issue is that you have an issue with overcompensation, and that shows up as extreme negative in other detectors, right? The other thing that can actually occur uh, that actually isn't the case for this experiment, but you can wind up um, actually not washing sufficiently, and as a result, the background fluorochromes um, that are in your, or, or antibody fluorochrome conjugates that are in your sample will actually cause certain instruments to um, have an excess in the subtraction of the baseline signal, and it's called baseline restore. And when that happens, uh, you can also have extreme negatives um, or uh, negatives that are uh, more dramatic than what you'd expect from your normal um, autofluorescent population. So, this is just a nice example uh, to show why you wanna make sure at the very beginning of your run, you go ahead and you, you check all of your controls, but you also check your fully stained sample that you expect to be the brightest for all parameters to make sure it's on scale. So that would be my suggestion and would have been my suggestion for this user. Go ahead, throw on that fully stained sample, make sure everything is on scale. And if it's not, make sure it's on scale and then make sure your single color controls are as bright or brighter so that you can have the correct compensation. So not much to do with crazy analysis there, but I just wanted to, um, to show you that. Okay. And then I'm gonna show, um, you know, with the time that we have, um, you know, I, I tend to go over a little bit. I'm gonna show one more example um, with compensation data. 
and uh, what can happen without the appropriate controls and kind of tie it into that last comment I had about the need for uh, the single colors to be as bright or brighter. So I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna uh, do new, open up this compensation. And I actually, um, as opposed to creating a whole new workspace, let me just work with a workspace that I'd already had for that one to save some time in case you guys wanna go over any specifics of compensation. So I'd had that workspace saved and what happened was I took a look and I took a look at these um, samples that were provided to me and I want to say thank you to um, a very big thank you to, uh, to my friend Mike. Uh, he, he's a fellow uh, SRLer um, overseas. He was very kind in getting some files over to me and um, I, I just want to extend my deepest thanks to him for, for, these, um, for this help here um, with, with troubleshooting data sets. So what we have here is we have all of the um, single color controls and the single color controls are all in the, uh, the comp group here. And we also have our two test files, right? And this file we don't need to worry about. We can have that in there. And if I open up that comp matrix, I kind of expand it out. I'm seeing that there's undercompensation. I'm seeing that there's issues here. So what I, um, I saw that based off of the, um, the acquisition defined. And what we can do is we can really take a close look with these N by Ns and say, where, where are we seeing this problem with the experimental file itself versus the controls? And why am I having this problem with over or under compensation? So if, you've, uh, if you joined in on previous sessions, what you'll know is that we have the layout editor where we can actually go ahead and we can um, take a look at n by n plots. Um, and when you take a look at those n by n plots, it's, um, what, in a more uh, clear way, right, in the layout editor, we can get a clear picture of, of what's actually going on. So for example, ooh, this one did not, didn't work out, so you guys uh, actually get to see an example of how I create that n by n plot. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna bring in this test file, and when I bring it in, um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to change it to the x-axis being the comp on um, the first detector and this being the comp on the secondary detector. He threw me off for a little bit of a loop there. Um, it would actually be a little bit better. Let me just go back in. I'm going to make sure I uh, gate appropriately on scatter and single cells. Let me do a general scatter gate. I'm trying to exclude most of this debris. And singles before I before I go ahead and do that n by n plot because so I want to show you the um, in the best way I can how to set this up. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to drag that single uh, cell population in, drag it up, and then I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to change it to be B530 and B585. We tend to delete this little text box right there because I don't need it. Duplicate this, carry it over. And then I'm going to change this to B780, it's the name of their detector. Okay. This is just how I make my own little end by end plot because I find it a little bit easier to work with as opposed to working with uh, the end by end where it, the data might be a little bit scrunched and hard to pull out in that compensation window. Okay. One more after this. So I'm just uh, I'm going ahead and I'm visualizing everything versus um, the the first detector that I looked at. Okay, I think I might have duplicated that one. Just double check. V450. This one should have been. Apologize that it didn't carry through from my workspace. We saved some time. I can go ahead and I can duplicate that. Come down, double click, and then I can change all of these to the secondary detector, which is the 585. And I can duplicate those. Okay. 
and go on and on. Just to double check uh, the n by n of everything, if you uh, prefer to, to work um, in this way, like I do. Okay, let me get a traditional n by n, or I can drag it over to try and get a better view here. Okay. So, I'm going to iterate by sample. I'm going to take a look at this test. It's not working because I need to drag this over. It's not going to show me anything if I don't have those gates selected, right? So that's a good example. If I don't have the scatter and single cell, it's not going to be able to show me those populations in this n by n. And one of the things that I see here is this overcompensation. Right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to hit the shift key, I'm going to drag this out, I'm going to make it pretty big so that we can all take a closer look at it together. So why is this channel overcompensated? That's the question that you ask yourself when you see this data. Why is it happening? We're talking about troubleshooting, we're tra talking about trying to, to clean up our data and trying to make sure that we're looking at things in the appropriate way. And this is going to, to not give us good statistics, it's not going to give us good results, and it's clearly overcompensated. Okay. First thing I do is I go ahead and I look at that single color control. Was it appropriate? Right. So very clearly defined here that there's an issue there. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to drag in this single color control that was for PE. Okay, because that's the detector. They used it off the blue laser, the uh, 585 nanometer filter. I drag in this comp, should turn off iteration. And what I see here, it's a little bit hard to tell initially, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to double click. I'm going to use large dots. I'm going to apply. You start seeing the point where the sample is brighter than the single color. So that's one of our rules of compensation, right? We want to make sure that our single color is as bright or brighter than the experimental sample. When you don't have that occur, what winds up happening is you have issues with, uh, with compensation. So the controls are going to be extremely critical as we're going through and as we're troubleshooting our experiments to see what, what's going on. Okay, so there is um, a variety of different things that we can take a look at with compensation, but the first thing I tend to look at is, is my single color as bright or brighter? Did I use the appropriate single color for my um, experimental setup? If you did and that looks good, you can dive a little bit deeper in. Does my autofluorescence of the positive and negative match up, right? Because that's another rule of compensation, beads and cells. Um, as it's calculating compensation and need to make sure that you're uh, um, appropriately selecting the right population for negatives and you can't mix, um, you know, you can't use cells as a negative for beads and a bead single color. So you want to be very mindful of that. And the third is you want to make sure that you're using the appropriate fluorochrome. It, if it's Fitzy, it needs to be Fitzy. If it's Alexa 448, it needs to be Alexa 488. You can't mix and match um, you know, GFP for Alexa 448, Fitzy Alexa 448, anything like that. And that goes for all of the fluorochromes. Okay. So that's a good example um, uh, from a friend of mine in another SRL as to why you can run into problems with compensation, with the compensation control. So it seems like a little bit of a, um, a rough day because we're, we're showing all examples of things that have gone wrong. But that's really the point of today is for us to discuss what can go wrong and how we can make it better. I would say it's a typical day for uh, most researchers. Yeah, yes, exactly. And um, we want to enable you to, to, to make sure you understand why these things are happening and how you can prevent it. Right. Um, let me just ask you a, a question that was uh, raised here. Um, I mean, I'm almost sure there, there isn't uh, or you wouldn't be showing this manually, but um, the question is, is there a plugin or something to make the uh, N by N plots in the layout? No, but that would be a wonderful, it's not, not that I'm aware of, it would be wonderful if there was, uh, and that's actually a really good idea. Um, but there, there currently um, is not that I'm aware of, but that's definitely something to, to bring up with Flojo. If you reach out to tech support at flojo.com, they, they're pretty open to different ideas. 
um, and specifically one that I'm interested in uh, that I was going to touch on today. Um, you know, I mentioned that stain index plugin, and we looked at that with the antibody titration. Something that I wanted to, to show briefly to check compensation, uh, if you know, if we have the time, is the secondary stain index, and we went over that in our compensation class. Um, but it would be really nice if there was a plugin available, actually, where we can automatically calculate whether or not our compensation was, was correct. Um, because what happens often is people might make tweaks or adjustments, and we've had conversations about this, it should never be done. It should always be, um, a, it should always be done, um, you know, based on statistical analysis and from the, um, you know, compensation algorithm that's in the softwares themselves with the appropriate controls. Um, but it'd be really nice if they had automated ways to check that so that it's not just visual inspection. Exactly, especially when there are more and more colors that you need to uh, look at. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, of course. Um, so uh, one other thing that I, I, I mentioned um, that I'd bring up, actually, I can, I can open up one of the previous um, workspaces, actually, was um, the, the use of a viability die and why it's so important. Um, we have post-its on this. This is, um, you know, a very quick example, but new. Um, I'm going to open up the um, one of the, the training um, workspaces that we uh, utilized. This one, sorry, I wanted to use the antibody titration one to show you why uh, the inclusion of a viability dye is important, not just to um, not just to pull out from dead cells, but also because what's going to wind up happening. If you don't include an, uh, if you don't include a viability, dye, your your results are going to be off. So that's something that happens fairly often. And this researcher was wonderful. They went ahead and they added in their viability dye. But what happens if you don't? Okay. So this is that titration example that I brought up earlier. If I open up the CD3 and I just went ahead and I look at um, forward scatter and side scatter and just this a little bit, make it a little bit easier for everyone to see. I make the assumption that these are my cells of interest right there. Okay. So if I make a gate right there, why does it matter whether or not I have a viability die? Double click in there, look at forward scatter versus uh, height versus area for singlets, do a quick little gate. Single cells, and then I'm going to look at CD3. Okay. CD3, I'll look at it versus the CD4 detector. Customize that by X. There. Okay. And this actually does have a little bit of an issue with, uh, with compensation, right? Right here. Uh, that's a separate discussion that we just went over. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use this. I'm going to negate where I believe my CD3 are. Okay. And again, I'm doing a, if I have, you know, if I was doing this for real, I would go ahead and I'd reference the unstained of um, sample, right? This is showing me 22.6% and it's showing me 14,851 cells. Okay. Now, when, um, when we're taking a look at the live cells, scatter, single cells, and we're looking at all of that, and if I look at that same population of CD3 versus, is that CD4? Is that in? What winds up happening, that number, oh, if I froze a little bit on me, Okay, actually don't put that gate in there. Um, this is interesting. That's weird. Um, it's not showing up here, which I've never seen happen before. It's throwing me for a little bit of a loop today. Um, let me try drawing in one more gate. Okay, there it is. Now, if I draw a very similar gate and I put it right there, look at that difference. You have 6.87%, you have 22.6%. Okay. 
without the inclusion of a viability dye and without gating out my, my dying dead cells, I'm getting a dramatically different readout for what my CD3 positive population is, okay? It's, it's not ideal, you don't wanna do it. Um, we highly suggest under all circumstances to include a viability dye because when you don't, you can very clearly see here what's gonna happen to your statistics, okay? You're gonna have a dramatic difference in what you expect for, um, or what you see for frequency and also for total count. So it's, it's a very basic one, but please include a viability dye at all times. Um, and I really just wanted to make sure that we, um, we main, uh, mentioned how important that really, really is. Okay. There's methods to go back and do backgating and, and really show the uh, inflojo uh, where the populations are um, based on um, backgating and, and all of that. And I can show if people are interested. Um, but I think for, for sake of time, we've gone over quite a bit today. So I think we can probably um, pause there and see if there's any questions or if anyone wants to go over anything specifically. Um, I did want to go over the secondary stain index and compensation and how to look at that um, when we're looking at this compensation data as well, um, in addition to all of these other parameters. But I do highly encourage um, everyone to check out our compensation video if they, if they want more details or unless they want to go over it now. So I think it's a good point where we could, we're going to be um, continuing these troubleshooting uh, sessions because there's so many different topics to talk about. So I could go on for another hour, which people wouldn't be appreciative of. Exactly. Um, so I think it's, it's a good time to open it up to questions at, at this point. Yes. I mean, so there are a lot of questions that have been answered um, uh, as we went along. Um, I'm trying to see if there are any new ones. Right. So, so there was, I mean, there was now just a question on the, um, uh, in terms of viability dye. So adding the viability dye before or after permeabilizing the cells, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, adding the viability dye before or after the FC block. Um, and, um, you know, essentially my answer was that we typically add the viability dye at the end because of all the steps that we go through with the washing and the staining. Yeah. Um, but, you know, technically, there wouldn't be a difference, so they shouldn't interfere with each other. But then the question was, can you add the viability dye if you are permeabilizing your cells for um, intracellular staining? And if you want, Kathy, you can answer this one. So I'll, I'll actually address both of those things about the timing and then also fixing and permeabilizing. So one thing you want to be mindful of when you're going ahead and you're, um, and you're doing your viability staining, like Rui mentioned, we typically tend to add it at the end, uh, and that's um, more specifically, typically if it's um, a DNA binding dye like DNA, um, uh, DAPI, PI, uh, stains of that nature. If you're utilizing um, a fixable viability dye, which is gonna tie into the next part of the question um, from the ne next person, when you're utilizing fixable viability dyes, you have to be mindful that at that step, because it's an amine reactive dye, you wanna make sure there's no protein or serum in the buffer at that stage. So typically um, you would do that um, you know, in the earlier steps, right? So you would, you would do that a little bit earlier. And then typically when you're doing your FC block, you can do it, um, you know, at the same time that you're doing your staining of your cells. So you could always start off with that first. Now, um, that goes into the topic of that there is fixable viability dyes. They're amine reactive dyes that will stain on the cell surface. Um, at a very base level for live cells, but they also have the ability to, to get in and stain intracellular amines for, for dead cells. And you can utilize those and you can um, stain for viability and then you stain for your surface markers, then you fix and perm, and then you stain for your intracellular markers. Um, we do have a flow post on that and I could always um, show everyone on our, uh, on our website if anyone's interested um, as we're checking to see if there's any more questions. But yeah. we have fixable viability dyes available in flow cytometry. I actually have a question for you that you can show um, there in Flojo. Um, somebody's asking um, uh, that in the latest version of Flojo, they're unable to put the fax plot layouts in the layout editor into a grid. Can you explain how to do that? The, you want it in a grid? Yeah, in the layout. I don't think I've actually ever done that before. <laughs> Um, Let's try and find out. 
Yeah, exactly. So I've done it before, not in the latest, but um, I've done it before. So you want the, the plots themselves to have the, the grids in the plot? Is that the question? Or, or like what specifically? Rui, if you, if you don't mind. Well. Yeah, I'm trying to, yeah. Um, so the question is, in the latest version of FlowDry, I'm unable to put the fax plots layout in layout editor into a grid. So I'm, I'm guessing um, to be aligned. Well, to be aligned, you would typically and then go to arrange and come up here and do that and make sure that that's aligned there. I'm not sure that I, um, that's something that I've necessarily done before. I know you have the option of, um, of, of having grids in the plot itself. If you go into preferences, right. if that's specifically what they're asking. That's right, they're saying, yeah, put them in the grid aligned, yes. Okay, put them in the grid aligned. Yeah, so I guess that's what you were showing there. To... So, yeah, so I showed that and then there's the option, like I just showed the, um, by going into preferences and, and graphs, you can show the background grid on the plot itself, if that's a separate, um, yeah, I've never played around with that too much, to be perfectly honest. And I might, we'd probably have to close out a Flojo and open it up again to see. Mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, typically what you do to line things up is to drag them and align them to one specific, um, you know, top or bottom or, or whatever you're looking at, align it to, whether it's vertical or horizontal. Yep. Um, and let me see. Yeah, I believe that's it. Okay. In terms of questions. Yeah. It, I know it was a little bit of a hodgepodge today. We really jumped and we went over a bunch of different things. Um, and there was actually more files I wanted to go over, but um, for sake of time, we um, I figured we should yep. stop. We can leave for another session here. Yeah. Exactly. So, so what our plan is for next week for everyone um, that that's still with us, we're going to be um, welcoming John Quinn from Flojo again, and he's going to be going over um, high parameter data analysis uh, as a part two session. So he went over a lot of um, the Flojo Exchange and um, different plugins and some um, you know detailed methods on how to go ahead and make sure that you can utilize those plugins. And he's going to go more into the analysis itself for our next session on the 8th. Um, and then we're going to be on um, a pause for a little bit likely uh, as we start to reopen our facility in the near future. Um, but we'll absolutely be continuing all of these education efforts. And I want to make sure that everyone's aware of that, that um, we are dedicated to providing this education and um, we'll be continuing and, and communicating with everyone in the future um, beyond next week as well. So, yep. all right. You. With that, I say thank, thank you. Very you. much, Oh, of course. Thank you. I hope everyone stays safe. And um, and yeah, we'll see you soon. See you next time. Sounds good.